Last night, he had this dream again. He somehow knew he was near water and could hear the two laughing at him. It was such a vague, stupid dream that he didn't even think to tell anyone about it, not even his wife. They were a good way towards their destination when Derek Satnav flashed a warning. He looked at her, frowned, and said, Floor. There's nothing else for you to do, is there? Paul, his travel companion, said cheerfully, No, well, not really. And what? What's happened? He replied, On the highway, two intersections in front of us, there was a serious accident. I'll just force my satnav to come up with an alternative route. If we turn at the next intersection, we can make a detour, go around the accident site and get back on the highway. We'll be late, but at least we'll get there. Half a minute later, he groaned, Oh, damn it! I jinxed it! The alternative route is also blocked. It looks like, at the current speed, we won't be able to get to the north office before 6 on p.m. Rather than try an alternative route, I will turn at the next junction and rejoin the southbound traffic towards London. He pointed to his complimentary phone in the holder on the dashboard. Paul, buddy, please do me a favor and call the office where we have an appointment and tell them what happened. Bring them my apologies, too. Paul dialed the number and called. Having finished the conversation, he turned to Derek and asked, Would you like me to call headquarters and tell them about this? Please, answered his comrade. But when Paul tried to dial the number, nothing happened. He frowned. Sorry, I just ruined your phone, he said apologetically. Oh no, not again. It's not your fault. I keep telling our IT people that there's something wrong with that damn phone. I think there's a bad connection somewhere. After lunch, I'll go straight to the IT department. I'll just run some errands before that. What will you do about your unexpected return to the office? If we get back before one, I can just go straight to my wife's office and invite her to lunch. Lately, she has been working on a number of special projects. I'm worried she's been overdoing it over the past 12 months. She always seems so tired. Derek was silent for a few seconds, waiting for the convoy to pass before answering, Sorry, but columns on the road always make me nervous. Oh, by the way, your wife is an assistant to Gary Briggs, the CEO of the company. I understand that you and Beth are friends with Gary and his wife, Sally. Doesn't this cause any problems? Paul answered easily. Well, it may seem so, but in fact there are no disagreements between us. Well, not yet. We usually separate work and pleasure. Derek rushed past the brightly colored rental car and spoke again. Are you going to call your wife and tell her that you're already on your way back? I'd love to, Paul said, grinning. But guess who left his cell phone in his briefcase in the trunk? Oh, never mind. After lunch, I'll drop by to see David Banning, my immediate superior. He will be able to call people in the north to reschedule the meeting. He glanced briefly at Paul and quickly turned his gaze to the motorway that led them back to London. What about you? Who is your direct boss now? Still Gary. He is still the person I report to. About. I was wondering if you had been demoted. After all, after all your high-profile projects over the last few years, it must feel like a demotion when you have to attend sales presentations and regional office meetings like the one I have planned for today. It's not a demotion, although I can understand why it might look that way. I have to admit, it's a little curious. Although I'm not entirely sure about this, it's exactly what I assumed. It seems that Gary judges some people who he thinks are not effective enough. But he doesn't know what to do because he's not sure if their mistakes were caused by them or if they were somehow frustrated or failed by the company's training program. And, since he himself had played a large role in the development and implementation of the training program, he wanted to make sure everyone was treated fairly before taking any blame. Derek said, Yes, it is clear. I guess that makes sense. However, this doesn't seem to be a good use of your skills, unless he has an idea to somehow identify the root cause of the problem and force you to create a director-led program to deal with it. Paul nodded and said, Perhaps you're right, although he didn't say anything like that. Then they started talking about things not related to work, about the chances of Aston Villa or Chelsea winning the cup, about the contenders for the Grand National, 
and other similar topics that men talk about on long and boring car rides. They returned to their employer's headquarters in suburban North London shortly before 1 p.m. Derek parked the car and walked out of the parking lot to the row of shops nearby, while Paul, briefcase in hand, entered the huge complex that made up the Hyperloggy Corporation. There were several clusters of office buildings and a modest factory floor where trial versions of the company's products were created for testing and for finalizing designs before they were built at the main plant near Cheadle Hume, near Manchester. Paul dropped his briefcase in his office, noting that his attractive secretary Rhonda had already left for lunch. It's a pity, he thought. She could book him and his wife Beth a table at one of the nearby restaurants. Still, no matter. There was a Weatherspoons pub on the high street. There's no need to make a reservation, he told himself. Besides, having lunch with Beth would be nice, even if it was just to go to the local Aldi store, grab some bread, cheese, and a few fancy bottles of wine with screw caps, and eat lunch al fresco in a nearby park. It would still be for Paul Magic. The offices of Hyperology Corporation's senior management are located on the ground floor so it was a short walk from Paul's office to the office of his wife, Beth, and their boss, Gary. Gary and Beth's offices were located next to each other, and there was a connecting door between them. Paul walked into the reception area of Beth's secretary, Jill. When Jill saw Paul, she froze. He didn't notice the shocked expression on her face. Good afternoon, Jill, he said cheerfully, opening the door to Beth's office. Please don't come in, Paul, Jill bleated, but it was too late. Opening the door, Paul himself froze when he saw Gary having sex with his wife Beth on her desk. Their heads turned sharply at the same time when they realized that they were no longer alone. Jill said in a quiet voice, Beth, your husband is... you... I... She stopped, suddenly realizing that he was talking complete nonsense. Paul looked, not at the lost lovers, but through them and beyond them. They answered him with glazed eyes, horror etched on their faces, caught in the middle of copulation. Paul turned and staggered out. As he passed Jill, he said nothing, as if she were not there. Soon Rhonda returned to her office and noticed that the door to Paul's office was open. She wondered who might have been in his office while she was away. She then saw Paul sitting in his chair, which was in the corner, away from his large desk. He looked so bad that at first I thought he was having a heart attack she later told a friend that day. Mr. Augustine? Floor, are you okay? She approached him and noticed that he was staring blankly into space and trembling so much that his teeth were chattering. She touched his neck to feel his pulse. He was weak and fast. His skin seemed clammy and cold. She noticed that his breathing was rapid and shallow. His lips were blue she had worked as a nurse for several years before deciding to go into the business world and had continued her first aid training, so she knew Paul was not actually suffering from a heart attack, as she had first believed. Shock, she thought to herself. Floor, Floor, are you okay? She asked with a hint of concern in her voice. He looked at her slowly and answered uncertainly. No, Rhonda, I'm not fine. I just found out that my marriage is over and in the worst possible way. The next few hours were a blur for Paul. Somehow, Rhonda managed to coax him into drinking a cup of hot sweet tea. But the tea, just like old wives' tales said, somehow made him feel better physically. But mentally, not much. He knew he had to talk to Beth, her lover, and his wife Sally. God, this will be awkward. How to tell Sally that both he and she were cheated on? Rhonda and someone else, a man, maybe Phil from accounting he wasn't sure, managed to get him home. They asked if he wanted them to stay, but he waved politely. He wasn't sure if they knew, and he didn't want to risk being exposed in front of them. He sat in his living room, wondering what to do next. He wanted to call his wife, but found that he had no idea what he could tell her after what he had witnessed. Fifteen years of marriage, and everything evaporated in an instant. He then got angry that Beth didn't bother to stop by his office to see how he was doing. She didn't even call him, let alone come home to check how he was feeling. He believed it was because she simply didn't care about him. She and Gary must have laughed at him together. This dream. Did they really laugh at it once? Are you kidding me? Did he somehow read their thoughts? 
looked into their dirty minds. Although he was not a drinker, he suddenly felt the urge to drink. He looked into the drinks cabinet and, right at the back, noticed a liter bottle of vodka that someone, he couldn't remember who, had brought with them from their vacation in Eastern Europe. Neither he nor Beth particularly liked vodka, so it languished there for a couple of years. He reached inside and pulled out the bottle, grabbing the glass at the same time. As he tore the paper tag off the neck of the bottle, he had another idea, darker and nastier. He remembered something he had read about in his high school history class. This was what Sir Walter Raleigh said as he caressed the sharp axe blade that would take his life when he was executed. It is a sharp but sure cure for all ills. He left the bottle and glass on the coffee table in the living room and went to the kitchen. He opened the box they called the medicine box, which contained all the prescription and over-the-counter medications. He rummaged through it until he found what he was looking for. Out of habit, he closed the box and returned to the living room. He looked at the bottle on the coffee table, then at the two bags, one in his left hand, the other in his right. The cure for all diseases, he said out loud. He filled the glass with vodka and opened both bags. Fine. They were full. They will serve his purpose. They will be a sure cure for all his ailments. A wild feeling of revenge seethed within him. He imagined what it would be like, two lovers sneaking into the house and then finding his dead body in the living room. Bastards, this will teach them. In his left hand was a super strong opiate painkiller that Beth had been prescribed when she hurt her back, and in his right hand was a sleeping pill that had also been prescribed for her. But she didn't use either one or the other. He took a painkiller, then took a long sip of vodka. Then he took one sleeping pill and took another large sip of vodka. He took another painkiller, popped it in his mouth, and reached for the vodka. Meanwhile, three very sad people sat in the dining room of Gary and Sally Briggs' mansion at 12 Damson Glade. Sally spoke first. Oh, you stupid, stupid little assholes. Of all the shit you could have done, you absolutely had to let him catch you having sex together. Jesus Christ, what the hell is going on in your heads? You, Gary, you are the CEO of your own very successful company, supposedly of superior intelligence, and you let our dear friend Paul see you doing this with his wife. Gary shrugged and swallowed the whiskey he had poured onto his finger before speaking. Well, Sal, I know it sounds bad, but, well, it is bad, but we tried to be careful about it, you know, but we kind of... They completely ruined everything. Damn it. If your idea of discretion is having sex with your lover on the table with the door open, then you don't stand a chance. You do realize that by now this will spread throughout the company, right? Oh my God, is it true? Beth asked. Yes, it's true, Sally answered angrily. When we started all this, didn't we agree that we wouldn't want or allow Paul to know anything about what was going on? To protect him. You... We, we all knew that he would never like the idea of you two being sex buddies, that we had to keep him out of it so as not to injure. What are you two doing? You are having fun in front of him in the most cruel, terrible public way. You publicly humiliated him and broke his fucking heart, you idiots. Do you understand that he may never get over this? Maybe we will never be forgiven? Have any of you talked to him yet? They shook their heads, silent, like naughty children in front of the headmistress. Oh, really? Now the anger in her voice was palpable. Beth, you should have at least made sure he was okay, or at least asked him how he was feeling. Where is he now? Beth spoke. He is at home, or at least I think so. I asked to check on my secretary, Jill. Apparently Rhonda, his secretary, and some guy from the accounting department helped get him home. Well, I guess that's at least something. Would you like to call him? Beth shook her head. No, I really can't think of what to tell him. Sally gave her a disapproving look. How about... I'm really sorry? How about this? Beth said. But I regret what? Apologize for me helping you and Gary? No, I can't say I regret it. Apologize for hurting him? Well, of course, yes, for that. But I'm very embarrassed to call him, for now. Gary took out his cell phone and called, and then said into the phone, Hi, Paul. This is Gary. 
Listen, buddy, what you saw, even though what you saw must have been a terrible shock to you, please, you have to believe me when I say that we didn't mean to hurt you like that. And what you saw might, well, if you'll let me, us, explain to you what it's all about, I think it'll answer some questions you might have. Please don't think that this will somehow harm your marriage, because it won't. Not really, unless you want it. Please come to us tomorrow at ten in the morning, and we will all have a decent and civilized talk about the situation. We really have some explaining to do for you, and frankly speaking, you deserve an explanation. The call went straight to the answering machine of Paul's cell phone. While Gary spoke, Paul busily and almost mechanically followed the routine he had established. Left hand, painkiller, sip of vodka. Right hand, sleeping pills, sip of vodka, then repeat. The next morning, at ten o'clock sharp, Paul rang the doorbell at the Briggs house. A worried-looking Gary opened the door and led him inside. They exited the hallway through the door on the right, leading into the living room. Two women were waiting for him, sitting next to him. This puzzled Paul. He realized that if they could sit so close to each other without pulling each other's hair out of their heads, then perhaps there was some truth to the message from Gary that he had listened to shortly before eight in the morning when he said that something needs explanation. Paul stood looking at them. Gary stood awkwardly next to his wife, and it looked a little like one of those prim, staged Victorian studio photographs. Paul told them, You three look like one of those damn Victorian studio photographs. Everyone is very prim and formal. However, all the depravity and abomination are simply boiling inside. They didn't know how to react to his unusual remark, so they remained silent. Nothing to say to anyone, said Paul. There was a sardonic and almost cruel note to his voice that unnerved them, especially Beth. Paul, Beth said, that doesn't sound like you. Where is my husband? My sweet, kind, gentle, warm, loving husband. He is dead. You killed him, Paul said cruelly. Beth covered her face with her hands and began to cry. Sally hugged her, comforting her. Sally looked at Paul intently. There was something strange and unusual about him. He was unshaven and looked like a ghost. He looked pale, deathly pale. She swallowed before speaking. Paul, I know what you saw must have been a terrible shock, but how are you? What did you do last night? Did you get any sleep at all? Did you eat? Paul trembled before speaking. No, I didn't eat. Could not. Sleep? Actually, no. Nothing to talk about. As for what I did last night, well, I kind of felt really sorry for myself, and in a moment of madness, I'm sad to say it, but I tried to commit suicide by drinking a liter of vodka and eating two boxes of pills. Unfortunately, nothing worked out for me at the last minute. Looks like I overdid it with the vodka. I threw up all the fucking pills. They looked at him, shocked by his words. Gary was the first to react. Oh my God. Oh, Paul, buddy, I am so sorry. We knew that what you saw upset you, hurt you, but what made you try to kill yourself? Oh, shit. Beth looked at him, tears streaming down her face. What would happen if we found your dead body? What would we do? Maybe they laughed at me again, Paul asked, shrugging. They were all puzzled by his remark. He suddenly felt very, very tired and sat down in the chair across the room in front of them. He looked at them. Why? And how long? They looked at him. Sally was the first to speak. Listen, Paul, I understand that it's not right for us all to be facing you together. This must add to your feelings of betrayal and loss and make you feel much worse. Can I come and sit next to you, please? Paul shrugged indifferently. Sally stood up and walked towards him. To his credit, Gary didn't make the mistake of sitting next to Beth. He remained standing in his place as a silent observer. Sally sat down on the wide and soft right arm of the chair. She pressed herself against Paul, but he did not respond. She placed her left hand on his right shoulder and said, Paul, I'm really sorry this happened. But if you'll allow me to explain how it all started and what's going on, I hope we can all move on and help you and Beth stay together as a couple. She squeezed his hand and said, 
Do you remember, at the beginning of last year, I was urgently taken to a private clinic with a gynecological disease? Well, I had surgery, and as a result of the surgery, which I think they did poorly, I became physically unable to ever have sex again. I know Gary is a very passionate person. I was afraid that he would run away, that he would have sex with someone else. He'll start an affair and maybe even leave me. He assured me that he would not do this. And although I believed him, I was still worried. I mentioned the problem to Beth when we were sitting having tea one Sunday morning. I think you and Gary were playing golf at the time. And she suddenly blurted out, I can help if you want. I can cover for you and Gary. At first, I thought she was joking. But then she convinced me that she wasn't. We talked about how we could make all this happen. A couple of days later, we told Gary about this idea. He, of course, supported her. We decided almost immediately that you would not at all like the idea of borrowing your wife, even for such an occasion, so, and it pains me to tell you this, we decided to keep you in the dark about this. I really, really regret this. But we were so sure that we could arrange everything so that you would never find out, and that it would not harm you in any way. But now, well, you're in a lot of pain. We all see it. And the fact that you tried to kill yourself, well, it makes me hate what we did. Paul looked up and then looked down again. When did it start? Sally answered him. It was 12 months ago. We decided that the first time would be at a barbecue we had. If you remember, it was a wonderfully hot summer day. We were cooking and eating, relaxing by the pool and drinking. We... I'm embarrassed to say this now, but we put something in your drinks to throw you off your game to make you fall asleep. And when you fell asleep, Gary and Beth got up. Beth walked up to you, kissed your head, whispered that she loved you. And then she and Gary walked into the house holding hands. Before they walked through the patio doors, Gary turned and asked me if I wanted to come with them and take a look. I said it wouldn't be wise to leave you alone since you were on some kind of substance. They nodded and entered the house. She stopped. The memories haunted her. Paul looked even worse. And what happened then? She shook herself before continuing. I stayed with you thinking that at least I owed you this. I held your hand and stroked your head. I apologized to you for what we were doing to you, to your wife. I think I even cried a little. I suddenly felt very guilty. After all, you were so very vulnerable there. You were our good, very good dear friend, and we betrayed your trust. I felt it was my duty to keep an eye on you, to make sure nothing bad happened to you. I mean, how would we feel if we were all indoors and I was watching my husband having sex with your wife and you stood up, turned around and staggered into the pool and drowned, or choked on his own vomit? Paul shook his head. Maybe it would be better if I just died. After all, if I died in your pool, I would never have known Beth was sleeping around. Beth gasped. But I don't want you to die. And I'm not with just anyone. I only sleep with Gary. Paul shook his head again. To sleep in the plural or singular is still to sleep. Paul looked straight ahead. What happened that first time? Gary and Beth exchanged glances. We left you with Sally. Then we walked through the doors and made love in the guest room. Sally didn't think it was fair to use our marital bed, Gary said. Paul looked at them before speaking again. What happened when you left? We were back in the back garden, Sally sitting next to you, holding your hand. Paul whispered, Did you laugh at me when you saw me? No, Beth shouted. We didn't do this. What makes you think we did this? She seemed worried. That's not true, Beth, Sally said wearily. When you returned to the pool, you were both laughing at Paul. I scolded you and you both were very remorseful. You explained that you laughed mostly out of embarrassment, but also because seeing him dozing in the afternoon sun was funny. She looked thoughtfully at Paul. Why did you ask about this? Do you have a reason? He told them about a recurring dream about the proximity of water and about people laughing at him. They looked at him all stunned and somewhat ashamed of themselves. He shook off Sally's hand. I can't believe you risked my life by drugging me with some substances. For God's sake. None of you have medical qualifications. You could easily kill me. Haven't you thought about this? They shook their heads. Obviously, they hadn't thought about it. Sally took his hand again. I'm really sorry, Paul. Is it true? 
We didn't think your life would be in danger. Gary purchased the drug from a reputable online store, so we have done everything possible to protect you, to protect your health. Gary spoke. Look, we also did everything we could to protect your marriage. I, well, we all talked and realized that if you didn't have special time with Beth, it could be detrimental to your marriage, so we made sure we never had sex at your house, only here, at work, or in a hotel room, and we decided that every weekend we should give Beth to you for your exclusive use. Then Beth intervened. That's why I had the idea that you and I would only have sex on the weekends, because I didn't think it was right for my husband to follow my lover into bed with me. Doing that, I mean. Sex with me on the same day. Because no matter how hard it may be for you to accept, we never intended to make you a cuckold. This relationship, ours, mine and Gary's, it was something separate from our family life. It was never our intention to humiliate you in any way. You have to believe me. You have to believe us. Crap, Paul muttered loudly. You don't even understand. How damn condescending and arrogant of you, you three shitheads. You let me have full and exclusive use of my wife on the weekends after you beat her down like a rusty gate all fucking week. Crap. Don't you realize, Gary, that having my wife... Five days a week versus my two is damn unequal and completely unfair to me? Even if I agreed and knew about it? And you're saying that you had no intention of humiliating me? Well, Beth, when you two are doing this on the table, when your poor secretary knows what you're doing and sees what the sudden discovery of you sleeping behind my back did to me, listening to the nasty things you said about me, don't you think this is humiliating? Gary shook his head. Sorry. This shouldn't have happened. And what I told Beth about you being a pathetic husband, I didn't really mean it. It was just stupidity on my part. Paul looked at him, then looked at the other two, fixing his gaze on his wife. And what's most interesting is that most people at work knew about it even before I did. He saw their surprised expression. Oh yeah, Beth. Your secretary knew it. And I wonder why the people in the shop, when they saw me, whistled that leet motif from Laurel and Hardy, the March of the Cuckoos. And why did some people give me the nickname Cookie? Beth looked stunned. Sorry, dear. I don't understand. Why did they do this? Gary blushed, and Sally gasped. Sally said, My God, this, this is terrible. How could they know? Paul replied, Because you weren't as careful and prudent as you should have been, were you? FYI, Beth, they mocked and ridiculed me as a cuckold, humiliating me, and I didn't even know why. And even those who didn't know about you, because I always had to play the role of a useless shadow, in many sales and technical meetings, they thought that I had been demoted. Well, now they can assume that the real reason I lost my interesting project job was because my boss decided to get me out of the way so he could sleep with my damn wife. He got up. I'm really sorry. I can't handle this anymore. I'm going home. Beth also stood up and moved towards him. She looked worried. You take care of yourself, Paul? Are you eating anything? He gave her a withering look. Yeah, that's right. It's like you don't give a damn about me. Beth gasped and choked back a sob. He turned to Sally, who was now standing slightly away from him. Sally, despite your part in this, I really feel sorry for you. I'm really sorry. You thought they were just doing it so she could sexually replace you, right? Sally nodded. Paul continued. But now it's clear that this is not true, isn't it? They have a hot and steamy love affair. They're not fucking sex buddies anymore, you poor idiot. They are lovers. Hot and cold-blooded lovers. He ran out of the house and returned to his home. The next few days passed in a blur for Paul. He didn't see anyone, didn't talk to anyone. He disconnected or turned off all the phones. He drank the drinks cabinet dry and was sitting at the kitchen table, and when the doorbell rang, there was a mug of water in front of him. His feet automatically but reluctantly moved towards the door. He hoped they were Mormon missionaries or Jehovah's Witnesses, because then he could tell them to leave. His best hope was that it wasn't Beth or anyone he knew. Opening the door, he was shocked to see his secretary Rhonda standing on the threshold of his house. In fact, 
He wasn't sure if she was still his secretary. He didn't know if he still had a job, and he cared even less. Can I come in, Paul? Please? She asked kindly. Yes, sorry, Rhonda. Where are my manners? Sorry. Please come in. Rhonda closed the door behind her, looked at Paul, and almost cried at what she saw. He was scruffy, unkempt, and smelled like he was in desperate need of a shower. And he also looked thinner. Paul led her into the living room of the room. For some reason, it no longer felt like home. She could feel it. Paul, when was the last time you ate? He looked puzzled. I can't remember exactly. When was the last time I ate? Oh, I had breakfast with Beth this morning. He shook his head in shock. No, it was on the morning of my trip to the north. When it was. Oh, Paul, she was horrified. This trip of yours was last Thursday. You haven't eaten for seven days. She noticed an abandoned cookie wrapper on the table. And you only lived on cookies and snacks, didn't you? He looked at her and suddenly broke down. He did something he was too ashamed to do in front of those who cheated on him. He burst into heart-rending sobs. Rhonda hugged him close and allowed herself to exclaim, Lord, you need this, don't you, poor, poor soul. What the hell did those bastards do to you? He sat down on the sofa. She sat next to him. She noticed that he had not shaved for a week, that his hair was unwashed, and that he smelled sour. The skin of his face under his beard seemed to hang loosely. He has aged terribly. He hesitantly explained to Rhonda everything that had happened, leaving out no details. At the end of his story, Rhonda threw up her hands in horror. Rotten, slimy, worthless bastards, she shouted. How they could treat you like that, the one they love or claim to love, only God knows. You're coming home with me. Take some clothes with you and your own shaving accessories and toothbrush. You will stay with me. As they pulled up to Rhonda's house, Paul noticed how nice it was. It was cozy there, and it was a real home. Paul knew that she was a widow and that her son lived in the States. He did something in Silicon Valley, lived there for several years, and, according to Rhonda, did everything right for himself. After he showered and shaved, Paul put on the clothes he had brought with him from home. Sit down, Paul, she said, smiling at him. I'm going to try to get you to eat something. My grandmother Mary from Lancashire made this dish for us when we were sick. It's called Pobs. It's basically bread and hot milk with cinnamon and a little sugar. This is what they give you when you don't feel well and haven't eaten for a long time. He took a spoon, ate it, and said, Wow, so tasty. He ate carefully, instinctively, knowing that eating quickly would make him sick. When finished, she said, I think the best thing for you would be to try to get a good night's sleep. Afterwards, I will bring you breakfast. You can sleep in my spare room. I made the bed while you were in the shower. We can talk in the morning. But now it's time for me to help you figure something out. Wow, he said, intrigued. Yes, the problem with cheaters is that they even cheat on each other. I mean, it's entirely possible that Gary has sex with multiple partners. Have you thought about this? The fact that your loving wife could bring an STD into the house? Oh, shit, no! I need to get tested at the clinic for STDs, Paul shouted, clearly disturbed by the thought. Stop panicking, Rhonda said firmly. We don't have to do this. I doubt you'll remember this, but my sister Dottie works at a wholesale medical supply store. I asked her to bring me a complete home STD test kit. It tests everything, including HIV. This is an experimental device. You no longer need to send a sample to a laboratory. It will do everything for you overnight. It will give you, us, the results in the morning. I doubt you have anything, but... You can't be too careful. He kissed her on the cheek and whispered, Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you very much. She pricked a finger on his right hand with a sampling needle, dipped a test strip into his blood, and placed it inside the device. That night, for the first time since he discovered Gary was sleeping with Beth, he had a normal sleep without that terrible scene repeating itself over and over in his head. The next morning, after he had shaved and showered again, he sat down at the breakfast table that Rhonda had prepared and ate an omelet and toast. Another good, simple meal.
he was pleased that the habit of eating was slowly returning to him. Rhonda showed Paul the test results on a printout from her laptop, which was connected to a home STD tester. God bless, I'm fine. Oh, Rhonda. She smiled at him and said, Oh, I'm just glad I could help you. He looked at Rhonda as if he was seeing her for the first time. She was ten years older than he and Beth, but he suddenly realized how beautiful she was. He then noticed that her breasts were large, much larger than Beth's, and that Rhonda had a deep and rather attractive cleavage. What are you looking at, Paul? She asked, amused by his tense expression. He paused, wondering how to deal with being exposed. He decided that the best policy was honesty. Mmm, I looked at your chest. Rhonda giggled and blushed slightly. Oh, really? These old ladies? She made them sway. I've had them for ages. Did you just notice them? Oh, no. Paul said sincerely. I've always noticed them, but I never realized how cute they are. The situation began to run away, like a train that suddenly picked up speed. Rhonda's thoughts said, Don't look at my breasts. You are a married man, and I am a widow. But for some reason, these thoughts did not coincide with the words. From her own lips, she heard, Oh, Paul, do you really like them? Would you like to see more of them? He nodded dumbly, and before the little Miss Sensible side could maintain control, she quickly pulled the top over her head, and Paul simply gasped as her breasts quivered and jiggled, freeing themselves from the top that was constricting them. Bloody hell, he shouted. Rhonda, I was wrong. You don't have big breasts. She's huge, she laughed. Do you like it? She said shyly. Oh, God, yes, he was delighted. I hope you won't be offended, but... Rhonda, could you take off your bra for me? She shook her head, causing her chest to quiver deliciously. No, I wouldn't want to. Gravity did not spare the girls. Now they tend to sag slightly. She saw him swallow like a cartoon dog. Several seconds pass it before he answered with a tremble in his voice. Do they droop a little? Yes, it is. You seem to like this idea. Oh, God, yes. Me. Please take off your braillet for me. Please. There was a hint of desperation in his voice that turned Rhonda on if she was being honest with herself. Okay, but please don't be disappointed, okay? He shook his head, muttering, I won't. The bra was removed, placed on the table, and Paul stared at Rhonda's breasts sitting in front of him. Please lean forward towards me. He exhaled. She did so, noticing the look of animal lust in his eyes, and suddenly realized that she was experiencing sexual arousal. She made her breasts sway from side to side. He gasped, and after ten years of celibate widowhood, Rhonda wanted sex. Right now. Paul, she said hesitantly, you ignited something in me. Could you come up to my bedroom? I want you to make love to me. Oh, God, yes, Rhonda, please, just go ahead. A minute later, they were in Rhonda's bedroom. Paul really liked her and told her so. He noticed a photograph of a smiling young version of Rhonda with a handsome young man in an RAF pilot's uniform. Is it you and your husband? He asked casually. Yes, it's Pete and me. He was an RAF fighter pilot during the first Gulf War. Oddly enough, it was not his service that killed him. He somehow developed chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and died in my arms in the hospital. He was only 38 years old. Tears sparkled in her eyes. She hadn't talked about her Pete to anyone in a while, so talking about him to the man she was about to have sex with was honestly a little weird. Paul sensed her inner turmoil. He looked at the photo and said softly, He looks like a really nice guy. You must have been very happy together. Pain flashed across her face. She nodded, unable to speak. Pete has nothing to worry about, Paul said sincerely. I'll treat you well, Rhonda. And I will never let you down or cheat on you. Rhonda nodded. She walked to the other side of the bed, took the photograph, kissed it and whispered, Goodbye, Pete, and carefully placed it face down on the nightstand. She looked at Paul, grinned, 
and said in a hoarse whisper, Make love with me, please. And don't worry, after my son was born, my tubes were tied. Paul nodded, and he and Rhonda quickly undressed and lay down next to each other on the bed. They kissed and hugged for what seemed like an eternity. And then Rhonda said, Make me your woman, Paul, now. They had sex, which brought them both satisfaction. Paul looked into her eyes. She smiled at him uncertainly and said, What are you thinking about, Paul? He returned her smile by saying, How much I want you, and I need you. A hell of a lot has happened to me in the last week, and finding you saved my life. You didn't have to look far for me, Paul. I was there every day. I wanted you. I missed you. But I knew that I could never have you. But that has changed. And here we are together. They made love again and then immediately fell into a deep sleep. A well-deserved, sexually satisfying sleep. Meanwhile, all was not well in Damson Glade. Beth wandered around the room in confusion, and Gary managed to pop into the office several times after the fiasco. Sally didn't know if this was a manifestation of the man's character or if he was too thick-skinned to care too much about it. Sally decided that things had gone too far. She knew full well that it was too late to save Beth and Paul's marriage. But damn it, she was going to try. Coincidentally, while Paul and Rhonda were doing this, Sally was addressing two wayward lovers. I don't want you to have sex now. From what Paul told me, you two idiots are in love. This is true? They didn't say anything, but looked at each other guiltily. Oh, said Sally. Well, I guess that answers my question. So where are we going? Gary, do you want to divorce me and marry Beth? No, said Gary. I want you both to live here with me. I know, Sally, that you don't like that you can't make love, and I'll try not to remind you of this when I have sex with Beth. Indeed, he nodded expressively. That's damn decent of you. So? While Beth and I live here as your wives, you live as a 19th century Mormon prophet? And where does that leave poor Paul? Beth answered her. Sally, to be honest, I don't know. I still love Paul, but I no longer love him the way a wife should love her husband. I'm sorry about this, Sally, but I love Gary. Sally shook her head. So the fact that we upset him so much that we almost made him commit suicide doesn't matter to you? Of course it matters to me, Beth shouted. I am not a monster. Please don't think I don't care about him because I do. It's just the kind of love you feel for a good friend, not a lover. Sally crossed her arms before speaking again. We really fucked him, didn't we? So there is no hope for your marriage. In that case, we better make an appointment with him and try to figure out what we can do to at least end the marriage for him as painlessly as we can. At least we owe him a lot. Gary sighed and said, Of course I'll have to fire him. I mean, from work. Sally glared at him and hissed, No! That made Gary jump. Such was the anger in that one word. But don't you understand, Sal, I'll have to fire him. He won't want to work there because everyone knows that he, well, that his wife and I are having an affair. Sally shook her head. That's not enough, Gary. If you do this, what happens when he decides to sue the company? Gary shrugged. Jesus, Gary, Sally thought. Having a mistress has turned you from a number one business brain into a first-class idiot. She suppressed her anger and answered Gary. You can't fire him. I sleep with your wife is not grounds for dismissal. If you don't have the courage to work with him, just take him on board as a consultant. And to soften the sore blow to his ego, give him a huge salary. And don't say, you can't afford it because I know we can. He agreed to her proposal, and as a result, Paul was written off the books and received a significant increase in income as a consultant. Meanwhile, Sally began to resent the fact that she, the cheating wife, when she finally began to realize it, had to do everything herself. She often called Paul, texted, or emailed to see how he was doing, but Beth seemed uninterested in even texting, let alone talking to him, although he initially made several attempts to engage her in conversation. And Sally was trying to save her own marriage, although, frankly, she was beginning to wonder why she wanted it. 
Just over a month after Paul found out about his wife's infidelity, Sally decided she'd had enough of the crap and asked to meet Paul at the always convenient Weatherspoons on the high street. She arrived a few minutes early, grabbed a pint of old pocktail hen, and sat down at a table near the door. When Sally saw Paul hugging Rhonda, she nearly spat out her drink. She recovered well enough and greeted Rhonda with a hug and kiss. When Paul went to the bar, Sally asked Rhonda, Are you two a couple? Rhonda smiled and shrugged. I suppose you could say that. We have sex until we die, so yeah. Wow. That's all Sally could say. Lord, I have to say that this is quite a surprise. So how did this happen? Rhonda shook her head. I think it's better for Paul to tell you this, if you don't mind. Of course I don't mind. I was just trying to help Beth get her head out of her ass and get back to her husband, but it looks like there's already a replacement for Paul's wife. Rhonda shrugged. Oh, I didn't even know about it. I've always had a thing for Paul, and I would not have sought it. But in these circumstances, when the door of opportunity opened for me, I simply stepped forward. I can't say I blame you, Sally replied. Oh, wait, Paul comes with drinks. Sally looked at Paul and smiled at him. Looks like we can congratulate you, Paul. Paul chuckled in response. You might be right, Sally, but this is a matter for the future. It would be nice if I could meet with Beth to talk things through, see if anything could be fixed, but... Well, after a year of her affair with Gary, when she didn't even want to talk to me in any meaningful way. So, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure that there is anything left to fix. Sally reached over and patted Paul's arm. Actually, I'm not surprised. I'm still so angry about how they handled it. If I were Beth, I would wait on your doorstep day and night until you forgive me. Rhonda Chimidin, yes, but you're not her, are you, Sally? Looking at it from a woman's point of view and from the outside, I think you have been played and fooled. How, Rhonda? Sally was intrigued by what she said. Oh, just think about it yourself. She said she was ready to replace you so that Gary wouldn't have to cheat on you. But she didn't want her husband to know about it. I wouldn't be surprised if she used her idea of replacing you as a cover for her true intention of having an affair with Gary. Shit, said Sally. I didn't think about this before, although I was a fool for not thinking about it, wasn't I? Paul said, Sometimes we trust people who shouldn't be trusted, but because we love them, or are attached to them in some ways, we don't realize that we shouldn't trust them. As soon as he said this, he saw a flash of pain on Sally's face. Well, Sal, I'm sorry if this remark offended you, but it only hurt because it was too close to the truth for comfort, Sally said with a hint of regret in her voice. You are right, your wife and your two best friends. Damn it, if you can't trust us, who can you trust? He shrugged, and Rhonda shook his hand reassuringly. They chatted like old friends. Finally, having finished their drinks, they prepared to leave the pub. You know, you'll have to tell Beth, Sally said. Or do you want me to tell her this news? Oh, I wouldn't want to use you as an intermediary, but I don't really want to talk to Beth right now. Why? Sally asked softly. Because right now I'm so nervous I'm about to throw up. Sally nodded thoughtfully. I'll tell her myself, she said. The news that Paul is having sex with Rhonda enrages Beth. This woman has a lot of nerve, she thundered. She's old and, and she has sagging breasts. This bitch should leave my husband, or I might just decide to divorce him. Sally was shocked. She even wanted to slap Beth in the face. Very much. She found her attitude very annoying. Don't be such a damn hypocrite, Beth. All last year you slept with my husband, and when Paul got some too, you started whining like a bitch. Act like an adult, for God's sake. And if you and Gary are doing this again, then give Paul the same. And please talk to him. You owe him that much, right? Beth just shrugged it in response. Well, if you don't talk to him, then I will. Sally snapped. And so it went for the next couple of months. Sometimes Sally and Paul chatted on the phone, sometimes texted or emailed, and often met for a chat over lunch, usually at the Weatherspoons pub. Their last conversation made Sally think. Sally, 
Paul said hesitantly. Have you been to another doctor about your physical condition, which means you can't have sex? Well, no, I don't know. The surgeon I contacted was supposedly the best in Europe. I met him at his clinic on Harley Street. Whatever, I would go to your GP and ask for a referral to a surgeon through the NHS. I mean, what do you have to lose? When Paul filed for divorce due to irreconcilable differences, this became the catalyst for Sally to also decide to move out and file for divorce. She was a wealthy woman herself, so she did not need to wait for a divorcee settlement. She simply bought a new townhouse in a gated community just off the high street. She had news for Paul, whom she had not spoken to for a long time. She wrote to him and arranged to meet at the pub. When he arrived, she realized that he looked rather sad. What happened, Paul? Where's Rhonda? I hope she doesn't think I excluded her from our meeting today. Paul shrugged. I don't know anything about Rhonda. She and I are already history. We're not a couple anymore. Oh, shit. No. Why? When did it happen? A month ago, Paul answered. This is all really so stupid. She spent a couple of weeks in San Francisco. I believe her son is a software engineer at Cisco. And when she returned, she told me she was going to live with him. It was a little awkward. I asked her when we were moving, and she burst into tears and said that I wouldn't go with her. It confused me, I can tell you. When I asked her why, what I did, she replied that it was not about me, but about her. She said she promised her husband Pete on her deathbed that she would remain faithful to him and that our relationship made her feel like she was cheating on him. And when I looked into her eyes, I realized that she was not lying. Sally trembled inwardly and, taking a long sip from her pint, asked, What's happened? We didn't move in together. We each had our own home. So all I had to do was collect my things and take them to my home. A few days later, we spoke on the phone, and she said that she had given her sister power of attorney, or whatever they call it now, to sell her house and its contents. Two weeks ago, I saw Rionda off on her flight. None of us could stop crying. She said that she would always love me no matter what, but that she would devote her life to taking care of her grandchildren. I gave her a very chaste kiss on the lips, and we parted forever. Oh my God, Paul. Not only did what happened to Beth, you certainly didn't need Rhonda to shit on you either. Paul looked into her eyes. It's all me. Is there something wrong with me? Sally shook her head and smiled. Oh, you're okay. Your self-confidence has come under some criticism, but it hasn't caused any permanent damage. I don't think so. She paused, deep in thought, before continuing. Paul, I feel like I still owe you an apology. She stopped his objections. No, really. That's how I feel anyway. When you were unconscious that first day, while you were sleeping, I promised you that no matter what happened, I wouldn't let Beth replacing me with Gary hurt your marriage. And although I was confident in every word of my promise, if I had thought better, I would never have done it, since I had no control over what Beth and Gary did. Now I know this, but then I succumbed to this confidence. Paul smiled at her. I accept your apologies. She returned his smile. But I need to tell you something else. I have to thank you, too. I took your advice and was referred by the NHS to a surgeon at my local hospital. I had to wait a month to see him after my GP referred me. But it was worth the wait. He said that the surgeon on Harley Street had performed the operation carelessly and had given me terrible advice. It turns out that the error can be corrected, and as a result, I can start having sex again. Oh, this is wonderful news. What do Gary and Beth think about this? Sally shrugged. I don't know, and I don't care. I left him and Beth living in the house, and last week I filed for divorce. Well, have you already had sex? Paul said quietly. Instinctively, Sally knew he thought his marriage had been broken up needlessly. Not yet, Paul, she said hesitantly. That's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today. Now Rhonda is gone which makes it easier. Paul, could you have sex with me? Paul looked at her, amazed at this turn of events. Why me? I guess I owe you one for helping break up your marriage. Besides, I've always liked you. Listen, let's come to my place. It's around the corner, where we can open a bottle of wine and talk about it some more. So they did.
After drinking two bottles of sparkling wine from the Kent Vineyard, they ended up in Sally's bedroom. They stood naked, and one look at Sally's magnificent body, her eyes and shiny black hair turned Paul on. Please, Paul, be careful. I will be with a man for the first time in almost two years. I'll be very careful, he promised. They enjoyed foreplay for a while until Sally felt ready for the moment of truth. They had sex, they made love twice more, and decided to sleep until morning. Was it sex or a night spent in each other's arms that decided their fate? But it didn't matter, because the result would have been exactly the same. They decided that after they received a final divorce, they would get married. They spent several weeks preparing for the wedding and honeymoon. They designed a special multicultural wedding that reflected their own experiences. Paul could have worn a kilt, but decided against it. Instead, he wore a suit and tie from his clan tartan. And when he saw Sally in her new wedding sari, he almost cried with happiness. You're so beautiful. I feel like the luckiest and happiest man in the world. And so the wedding of Paul Angus Augustine and Salvandera Sahota Kaur took place. There was a universalist church minister for Paul and Sally's Sikh friend from college, dressed in colorful formal attire for Sally, and they exchanged vow they had written for themselves. The ceremony took place outdoors under a large canopy, and fortunately the weather was good. Ladies from the local Sikh Gudwara provided food, and Paul's friend, who had a mobile bar, provided it for free. Paul only paid for the drinks, and their mutual friend took photos and video. Rhonda arrived along with her son, who looked at Paul coldly. This made him chuckle, and although Beth and Gary were also invited, they did not come in, however. They sent a nice gift, so their absence was not particularly a slight, although both Sally and Paul considered it a slight. Unfortunately, the damage done to Sally by a bungling surgeon meant she had little chance of having children, but there was always IVF, adoption, or guardianship. Life, Paul realized, was pretty good. While Paul was thinking to himself, smiling, sipping from a glass of champagne, his new wife was thinking, Oh, I'm coning to jump on your fucking bones tonight, mister. And all the other nights of our family life, too. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.